in this special edition of Straight Talk Africa. Eleven years after South Sudan gained its independence, we'll take stock of what this country has accomplished for its people. Has the promise of a new dawn been realized? And what lies ahead for Africa's youngest nation? We'll bring you in-depth reporting from our team in the capital, Juba, and expert analysis. We'll also hear from South Sudanese people at home and abroad about what they want for the future of their country. I think involving the youth is a very, very important uh, part of the solution. We appreciate what the previous generation has done, but at some point you have to pass on the torch to the next generation. South Sudan, the road to democracy. Straight Talk Africa starts now. Hello there and welcome to Straight Talk Africa. I'm Heidi Adams. Thank you so much for joining me. On July 9th, 2011, the people of South Sudan erupted in celebration as that country became an independent nation. After a decades-long struggle for statehood and self-determination, South Sudan finally seceded from Sudan. And for this young nation, as for any country that's had to fight for its independence, the road to democracy has been neither straight nor smooth. In the next hour, our reporting team will take you inside South Sudan for a closer look at the progress made, the problems that persist, and more importantly, the critical path forward. John Tanza is the managing editor of VOA's South Sudan in Focus radio program. He's in his home country, and we begin our coverage there with John on the streets of Juba. With the Independence Day plans dampened, many South Sudanese in the country and worldwide are now looking forward to 2023 elections. However, the slow implementation of the 2018 peace agreement has many concerns that it will never happen. So far, parties to the agreement have only implemented two chapters addressing power sharing and constitutional review process, but six chapters remain unfulfilled. The question for many is why? Kwaje Lasso is the chairman of the South Sudan National Movement for Change, a rebel group that refused to sign the 2018 peace deal. I was very involved in this process of bringing change. Uh, I sit in front of you here today as member of the negotiation in, in, that brought the RRs. However, uh, we, some of us realize that agreement has a lot of uh, loopholes that need to be addressed. In fact, that the, the agreement fails to address the fundamental root causes of the crisis. Lack of democratic space within the then ruling SPLM party, poor governance system, corruption, nepotism and tribalism were some of the drivers of South Sudan's political crisis. Some South Sudanese representing various groups that signed the peace agreement have different opinions on the slow implementation of the deal. Ambassador John Guy, a member of parliament from President Salva Kiir's Sudan People's Liberation Movement, says it is up to the leaders of the country to chart the way forward. I think the debate should start now. If the agreement is coming to an end, say in seven or eight months, are we going for elections? If so, how? What are we going to do? And what are the checklists? If we are not going to election, then are we going for a new debate as to whether this agreement is useful or we are going to throw it away and come with a new agreement. Many South Sudanese worry about what will emerge after the end of the transitional period in February 2023. Among the issues preoccupying citizens are the tough economic environment, skyrocketing prices and unreliable sources of income. The way forward is to implement the revitalized peace agreement. If they implement, the rest of the thing will follow. And if later on there is free and fair election, that's what I'm yearning for. The future for this country is rule of law. If we don't have rule of law, we are finished. We have to really think hard or be realistic also that are we ready 
psychologically ready, prepared to vote, uh, and also uh, is is the ground prepared, is leveled for everybody to come out and also do these things. These are uh, demands established by democracies all over the world. A high time that they should go to various villages and ask them, what do you think of us? What do you think we have gone wrong? And what do you think can actually build peace among the different community? Youth who comprise the majority of South Sudan's population say they live in fear due to restricted political space, lack of press freedom, frequent harassment by security operatives, and increased violence around the country. An incident like the deadly violence in Warab State that left 30 people dead serves as an example. Speaking from the diaspora and looking on, youth say it's time for country's leaders to make way for them. Involving the youth is a very, very important uh, part of the solution because at the end of the day, uh, we appreciate what the previous generation has done. But at some point, you have to pass on the torch to the next generation. As the country forges ahead with plans to hold elections next year, not everybody believes the country is ready for democratic transition. Malakal Gok is a member of the SPLMIO faction, loyal to General Simon Gatwich. So I said, he says the country President is not ready for elections. From calling for election, rather leading focus on implementing the security arrangements bring all the oppositions back to the country, and then give them a freedom of political democratization system where everybody will also contest freely. Despite that sentiment, President Kiss SPLM party is mobilizing its members for elections, saying the country is on the right track. Lado Artema is the Secretary General of the SPLM office in the United States. We establish a nation and uh, we have to have that window to dialogue among ourselves even if you disagree with the government you have to have also create for yourself that space to speak out to the government and present your problems so that the government can actually respond and address them if you don't have that window of communication and you run out and uh, defect and form a global movement then uh, then there's no uh, dialogue with the 2023 elections questionable due to unfulfilled peace agreement and Independence Day stripped off of its celebratory atmosphere due to poor economy. South Sudanese are calling on the government to ensure peace and security in the country and to provide basic services. John Tanza, VOA News, Juba, South Sudan. And that was excellent reporting there from our team in Juba, John Tanza, Karina Chowdhury and Andrew Wani. Thank you. So we are South Sudanese people at home and in the diaspora whether they think their country is ready to hold national elections. The forces has not been unified up to now. Because whenever uh, there is an election, the security must be tight because people will be free to move uh, during the election. The security is not, uh, is not up to date some areas. So these are the questions that we ask ourselves that how far the government has gone with that one. But for direction, we are willing for direction. We are ready for direction at any time. The peace agreement, uh, the time that is taking, it's slow. And also the fact that uh, we are just uh, coming out of war and people are hoping that the government will, uh, will finally sit down and make a coalition government that will move towards election and uh, into a democratic process that will uh, uh, bring solutions to the current situation. What is happening about the coming elections is that we are putting everything in God's plans. God will decide if I will be alive during elections to vote or not. If I am alive, why will I not vote? Life is tough here. The prices in the markets are high. We need the election to be there because when we do, when there is an election, there will be some good changes. But our main fear is up to now, there is a great insecurity in the whole country. Before the election, pe people go for uh, census because the census needs to, to register everybody in the country. 
But if there is a, a lot of insecurity, it will be even difficult for those who will conduct the census to go all over every parts of the country. So these are our many fear. Now, 11 years after independence, what's been accomplished for the people of South Sudan? What hasn't? And what lies ahead for Africa's youngest nation? Well, earlier, John Tanza sat down with political leaders and analysts in the South Sudanese capital, Juba, to discuss South Sudan's road to democracy. I am here in South Sudan's capital, Juba, with three distinguished guests who are going to be taking part in this special edition of Straight Talk Africa. But before we get into our discussion, I would just like to bring to our listeners the context and the background of what, is hap what has been happening in South Sudan since the country got its independence. 11 years down the lane, South Sudan experienced two bitter street battles fought here in the capital Juba between the South Sudan People's Defense Force and troops loyal to former rebels of the SPLA IO under the chairmanship of Dr. Riyak Machar. One agreement was signed in 2018. Its Im implementation is still going on. Some analysts say the parties and the signatories to the agreement implemented it selectively. That is, they took chapter one, which is on power sharing and uh, responsibility sharing, and then chapter six, which is on constitutional review process. The other six chapters have not been implemented. And a lot of South Sudanese who spoke to us here in Juba say they are casting doubt that the transitional government will complete the other six chapters before 2023, which is the end of the transitional period. With me here in our studio at, uh, in Juba here, on my right is Honorable Stephen Parr, Minister for Peace Building. And the lady in the middle is uh, Lona Merakaje, an activist who has been uh, advocating for peace for like eight to nine years. And on our far right is uh, Honorable Michael Makui, the Minister for Information and Postal Services, and at the same time, the government spokesperson. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this special edition of Straight Talk Africa. Thank you. Before we get into the hot issues, I would want to start with you, uh, Mr. Minister. The country got its independence 11 years ago, and your government has been you know, struggling to bring everybody on board so that you can silence the guns. Could you give us a scorecard on that? Well, uh, thank you very much for uh, this opportunity. In fact, the government of South Sudan, of course, uh, with independence in 2011, was established. And, uh, and before we could put the, our house in order, there erupted the crisis of 2013. Crisis of 2013 put us, uh, was a real setback to us in the government. And uh, not only in the government, but to the people of South Sudan as such. So we continued. And uh, we started negotiations immediately with the, in December the same year. And we signed the cessation of hostilities. That was followed by a series of negotiations which culminated into the signing of the agreement. Uh, the last agreement, let me, let me cut off all the other agreements, but the last agreement was signed in 2018. This is the agreement which is now operational. And this is the agreement that the government, the, 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 the transitional government of national unity is implementing. And uh, this is where we are. So far, uh, yes, we have not achieved all that is provided for in the agreement because of other hurdles. We have ever been saying that this agreement was not actually meant to be fully implemented, otherwise, the, 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 the time frame which was allocated for that is not sufficient and not possible to really implement the agreement as it is. 
But nevertheless, the government have been trying its level best to implement the agreement. And uh, so far, we have uh, almost finished Chapter 1. And Chapter 1 is only about uh, what is left in Chapter 1 is the issue of the commissions and institutions. And most of these are connected with the enactment of laws which have not yet been enacted or amendment of laws which are not yet amended. So we, there is no way we can proceed without. Uh, chapter 2, yes, this is where we have difficulty, really. And in Chapter 2, we have difficulty in terms of implementation because of so many problems. Chapter 2 is the most expensive. Uh, because to, it involves the unified forces, unified security, for, uh, security, security, security mechanisms. Mechanism. Yeah, that is what I Why refer to. Why is it to. expensive? It is expensive because uh, it requires so. It has so many requirements. It has so many requirements, and uh, so many uh, proceedings to be conducted. However, despite all these difficulties, well, of course, one of them is the finances. We don't have the, the necessary required uh, resources for funding this process. Yes, we have, we have forces in the field under, undergoing training. These forces are supposed to gra be graduated, but uh, up to now we are unable to graduate them simply because of two things. One, for you to graduate forces, you must have these forces fully, full in combat uniform. They must be armed and they must have uniform. The arms embargo which has been imposed on us by the international community has made it impossible for us to acquire all these. We don't manufacture them here, but it has made it impossible for us to acquire all these. We'll, we'll, we'll come back to the other issues going down the line. Let's give a chance to Minister Stephen Parr, who is representing the SPLMIO. Honorable Makwe raised crucial issues here. One, he said the agreement was not meant to be implemented. Very difficult agreement. And the government and the other partners are trying their best to implement it. He touched on Chapter 2, which I was going to ask you about. There are troops that are still in cantonment areas, and the minister is saying there are two issues, money and secondly, the arms embargo. Do you subscribe to his conclusions? Well, overall, I agree with Honorable uh, Michael that the agreement is a huge operation. The implementation of the agreement is costly, uh, in need time, but I disagree respectfully with the idea that the agreement was not signed to be implemented. No, it was not meant to be implemented. He said yeah, it was meant to be implemented. The agreement was meant to be implemented. It was signed to be implemented, and it has to be implemented by Artigono. Another thing I want to correct here is that I and Honorable Makwe are members of Artigono. We don't necessarily represent our parties to some extent. We chaired one... But you are, you, are, we, you are in the yes, government are, on the ticket of the SPLM? Well, in the government... SPLM-IO. In the, in the government, we have a common responsibility as one government to implement the agreement. So the agreement must be implemented because the government of the day, the RT owner, was established by this agreement. And the mandate of this agreement, according to Chapter 1, of this agreement. The mandate of this government is to implement the agreement. This government is a government of peace agreement to implement the peace agreement. Our mandate is that our prime mandate is for us to bring peace to South Sudan. So the agreement must be implemented. If we don't implement the agreement, then we will all suffer from the legitimacy crisis. It is this agreement that legitimizes us. It is this agreement that put us in one government to bring peace to the people of South Sudan. So the agreement was meant to be implemented, and it has to be implemented in letter and in spirit. Yes, I agree with him. It cost a lot to implement it, especially Chapter 2. 
I also doubled as a Secretary General of the NTC, mm -hmm. which is uh, composed of ministers. It is a ministerial committee to implement Chapter 2, especially the transitional security arrangement. And how, how, how far are you with the, the preparations for the graduation of the unified forces? Because this is, we spoke to people around the country and they're saying, when you talk about elections and there are no unified forces on the ground, who is going to provide security? So how far are you with that process? I will, I will want you to be brief so that we give Lon an opportunity to also um, add. Uh, overall, the only progress we have made is to uh, we have made the following progresses, and you must also acknowledge them. We have maintained this permanent ceasefire because transitional security arrangement is not only the graduation of forces. It was containment of forces, assembling of forces, barracking of forces, unifying the forces, training them together. We have accomplished this in our training centers. We are left only with the graduation of forces. Graduation of forces is not also an end in itself. It is graduating them, deploying them. This is, as Honorable Michael put it correctly, it is a huge operation which is very costly. South Sudan cannot do it alone. We have been approaching the international community to also come in to support us. Yeah, I know that uh, you guys, uh, the, the partners to the peace agreement, have spoken several times saying the international community must come in to help. Let me give an opportunity to Lona, I will come back to you. Let me give an opportunity to Lona to hear from her. What is the civil society seeing that everybody is not seeing? Some of you have been part and parcel of the implementation process. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, Tanza. I, I want to say that. In 2018, the agreement was received with a lot of hope, trusting that what was signed is to be implemented. And I want to reiterate that until today, we still see that what has been signed could be implemented and can be in implemented. So what coming but what to, is preventing it coming from to, being implemented? Thank you very much. Coming to what the civil society see is that we see intermittent implementation of the agreement and that boils down to what we refer to deficiency of political will among the political actors regardless of particular party so to us as civil society we feel that those that constitute the current Archigonu do not have the will to implement the agreement perhaps they are comfortable and they do not see what is going on outside of the confines of their comfort you zone. Both of them are laughing. Yes. That means you have touched their heart. <laughs> that's that's what, what basically do you mean what by the political citizen. will. I see, I see the government meeting, committees are busy, and th there's some activities going on. Yes, it in is. In terms of uh, the partners trying their best to make sure that they implement all the eight chapters. What do you mean when you say there's no political will? It's puzzling. You know, the agreement in itself, and I think this is a problem that faces South Sudan in all spheres of governance in this country, and I have said this repeatedly, that one of the problems we have is we have complex documents as the agreement, but when we come home, we don't develop legs to anchor the documents. The legs to anchor the documents are operationalization equipment, like instruments. We needed to have different instruments to operationalize the agreement. That has not sufficiently happened. You are a member of the constitutional making process or? Constitutional amendment committee and at the what same time I'm a member done? of the public finance management what, what oversight committee. What progress have committee. you done? Give us a score sheet. From our side, from our side, team. one of the things that we have done and I always say that the, the drafters of the agreement needed to sit where we are sitting is that within 21 days we were able to incorporate the agreement into the constitution and come up with amendment number six which incorporates the agreement into the constitution. After that, we looked at the security laws within the prescribed time frame. 
we were able to complete the review of the security law from our side. Where did it get st stuck? At the executive. Honorable Michael McQuay, the ball is in your court that you, the executive, have uh, sat on what the other committees have passed on to you. Could you comment on her uh, conclusion that there's no political will to move you forward? You see, the, uh, it is unfortunate, with due respect to her opinion. Who is that person who has the yardstick for measuring the level of commitment? This is the point. I have been hearing so many people, and especially the civil society, that the government does not have the will. What is their yardstick for measuring the commitment, the level of commitment of the government? To me, I say we are fully committed, and this is why we are here now. We have reached here so far. I said this agreement was not to be implemented, as I said it earlier, because the international community the very international community that supported us and gave us the assurances that you sign this agreement, we will stand with you and we will implement it with you. Just immediately after signature, they sat back and began to tell us, you implement. You must be seen to be moving. We asked them, as said by my colleague, Stephen, we asked them to come for our support. Only very few friendly countries managed to do something for us. But up to now even, some of them are not signatories to the agreement. They have not signed the agreement. And they come and talk to us that you must implement the agreement. Not that only, but in order to obstruct us more, and to tell us that this agreement, we do not mean it to be implemented, is the arms embargo. Yeah? Once they went in for the arms embargo, to make it difficult for us to graduate the, for to graduate the forces. Because if a force is not a force if it doesn't have an, if you don't have a gun, a rifle to give to a soldier, he is not a soldier. We don't have the guns. But these forces, uh, sorry to cut you short, Mr. Minister, these forces belonged to various warring groups. They were not fighting the government with sticks. They had their guns with them. So when they were taken to cantonment sites, where, where did they leave their guns? Well, uh, you are right in that. But we cannot, we did not come here to blame the past. But we need to look forward and see how best we can move forward from here. Yes, a mistake was committed when these forces were taken to the training centers. A mistake was, the mistake was that these forces, instead of they handing over their guns, especially the opposition forces, for the government forces, for the SSPDF, their forces are in their barracks. Their guns are in the barracks. Their guns are but The problem is these forces who were in the opposition that came and were training for, taken for training. These are the forces that have no guns because of a mistake which happened in the past. Now, for us to graduate these forces, we must get arms for them. And the international community here tells us that you graduate these forces. And when we say, OK, lift the arms embargo so that a, a good Samaritan can give us arms to graduate these forces. And they say, no. Minister then what, 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 I, what is their intention? Um, where, where did you leave your guns, the I.O.? Uh, let, 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 me cor let me correct one thing. Uh, and this is a, a policy that has been going on for a very long time. That the reason why we are not graduating the forces is a lack of weapon. This is not serious. The I.O. weapons are in the cantonment. And for your information, John, the uniform that SPLM, SPLA, the, 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 the uniform that SPLA I.O. forces wear is the same uniform that the, uh, the uh, South Sudan uh, People's uh, Defense Force, Force wear. also wear. The AK-47, which is especially the weapons of the, what you call organic weapon of the forces, are there. But there was a rule that when you get to the cantonment, 
you are disarmed. You leave your weapon here. Even the government is not supposed to come to the training centers with weapon. Web training everywhere in the world is done with a stick until the time of graduation. If we need weapon today to equip those forces in the training centers, lack of weapons will not be the obstacle, practically speaking. Uh, if we had weapons for fighting ourselves, why shouldn't we have also weapons for graduating our forces today? In fact, the truth on the ground, John, is that there is no lack of weapon in South Sudan. Actually, we have surplus of them. We, they, they, the abundance of the weapon in South Sudan is also the problem to the stability of our country. We can get the weapons today, especially the organic weapon of the force to graduate them. About arm embargo and other things, that is a different issue altogether. What we are blaming the international community for is that even where they are now, in the training centers, our forces do not have the, 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 the human, you know, the, the necessities for human life, medicine, shelters, food. This has been a problem. The size of our economy and with the, the, the you know, the, the impacts of the, of, of, of the COVID-19 and the economic crisis all over the world, as you can see it. We are a young economy here. If the international community is serious about bringing peace to South Sudan, South Sudan need financial aid now. And not only financial aid to process, because graduation is an event. Yes. But the process of transitional security arrangement is a tall order. Yes, you, you, you said that the before. Bulks, the bulk of the fighting force of the SPLA-IO is still in the containment. Yeah. Let's, let's, get, let's get to the details of what is happening at the cantonment side and what has not been done. Let me give an opportunity to Lorna here to react. Lorna, you've heard from the two uh, members of the executive here, uh, Minister McQuay is saying the, it is the arms embargo that is preventing the graduation of the unified forces. Minister Stephen is saying, no, they are arms. He doesn't believe that is the arms embargo that is... What do you see, the civil society? What do you people see? I mean, how, how do you see the implications of these statements for uh, the peace agreement to move forward? I think, you know, going back to what we... There's this question about quantifying political will, quantifying commitment, and Honorable today put it in a very nice way, the yardstick for commitment. We can clearly see from the same house, this is what civil society see, from the same structure, there's different perception of why not move forward. I think to us that is discouraging, because to us that shows that there is no shared vision of where the current Artigon wants to take the country. Because if you see what Honorable Minister have said, we look at it differently. The arms embargo was imposed because of a reason. There are ways through which we can be able to negotiate the country out of the arms embargo. There are and what are the ways? There are deliverables. Can you, can you Implement tell us about the agreement. how they can come out Implement of the arms embargo? Implement the agreement. Let's not stick and say that because we don't have equipment to graduate the forces. Let's use the existing equipment that on my left, one of the executive is saying. That equates, that, that balances the equation. Number two is that South Sudan is a country that is producing oil. Where does our money go? And as civil society, we asked this question and our colleague was locked up. And people feel a bit coy to ask the question. But the question is, when Guru Shia Jama? The South Sudan oil is being explored. We know that at the moment, even the transitional financial arrangement to, to Sudan, we have completed paying it. Still, we are not seeing money translating in the country. And we'll bring you part two of that discussion after the break. This is a special edition of Straight Talk Africa, South Sudan, the road to democracy. Straight Talk Africa will be back in a moment. Stay with us. Health, wellness, sport, beauty, medical breakthroughs. 
Healthy Living cares about your well-being. What are the main health concerns in Africa and around the world? Find out the latest on coronavirus. Connect with our experts and ask them questions. How long does the virus stay? Join me, Lino Khmudu, in Washington every week on Healthy Living, right here on VOA. Welcome back to our special edition of Straight Talk Africa. This week, our focus is South Sudan's road to democracy. Now, 11 years after it won independence from Sudan, South Sudan's economy reflects two very different realities. Those who are thriving, people who work in sectors like oil, real estate, or luxury goods and services. And then there are those stuck in relative poverty, which happens to be the majority of the country's citizens. VOA's John Tanza has more. Custom Market in Juba Town is one of the oldest markets in South Sudan, and vendors from across Africa, including Uganda, Kenya, the Democratic Republic of Congo, Sudan, and South Sudan, come here to tout all kind of products from their makeshift shops and escape the blazing sun. Here, you can find anything from food items, new and used clothes, phones, and car spare parts. Most of the local traders say, however, their profits are low because few South Sudanese can afford their prices. The challenges that we are facing in our business, uh, the price of everything have been increased in the market there, but we are still selling in the same price. Because if we, if we increase our price, the customers will not buy the thing. Uh, we are facing a lot of challenges. One of the challenges are those of city council. They are coming to take from us uh, other, especially like money for, for garbage, other they said are for trading lines, which even we don't have. For many small-scale vendors, business was good before the 2013 and 2016 political crisis, which they say dented the economy. Before we used to buy things cheaper, but now the prices have increased. From the wholesale, a shoe for 3,000 and a half has now increased to 4,800 Sudanese pounds. We don't get clients who can afford these prices. But not all South Sudanese are experiencing hardships. For some, like Lawrence Korbandi, former legal advisor to President Salva Kiir, an investor in real estate and education, business is good. Juba and other towns of South Sudan, uh, you can invest in them, uh, provide that uh, you select your own choice as investor, be you local or national investor, or uh, international investors. Kurbandi says investors and traders should look for new opportunities in the country. He says South Sudanese who have money are seeking for better services from investors. In situations like ours, there are three types of investment. Investing in education, because every uh, household would like that children to go to best schools. That is why some of us are sending their kids in the neighboring countries. The other investment is the health. People never stop being sick in uh, countries like ours. So if you invest in good hospitals, you will still make money. And the third one is the food commodity. South Sudanese businessman Chol Lam, a senior partner at the local South Sudanese oil company, Chang Wei CW, also says he's doing well in the current economy. The e economy of South Sudan focuses on the crude sales, but in terms of the services, there is a huge revenue stream within the oil services. I would say equal to the oil that's being sold in terms of uh, the, the crude. The oil services are dominated, uh, I would say, by the Chinese. Uh, they, the majority in the oil sector, in the services. Uh, and the budget for oil services, I would assume it's something close to 1.5 to $2 billion annually. Another sector that appears to be thriving despite the tough economic climate is interior design, like APA Interiors, the only one-stop interior design shop for locals and expatriates in Juba. 
Apajok Aler, who studied interior architecture in Italy, has found her niche in Juba, where she has introduced interior architecture to more clients. Our business, it's going well. We have a lot of clients um, and um, we can't complain. There was a missing gap and we were that link that we needed to, to be in. There were a few challenges, obviously. Um, setting up a business um, from, the, from the start is always hard. Um, and also making people understand the need for interior design. Despite the tough economy, some South Sudanese are making ends meet any way they can, like this University of Juba student who operates a local motorbike taxi known as Border Border, which he says has enabled him to continue with his studies. I'm currently upgrading to degree. So with no one to sponsor me, to support me, and with no proper job, that's when I decided to create for myself a business, at least to facilitate my studies and even support my family. This Nigerian national has been importing his country's fabrics into South Sudan for 21 years and says the country offers business opportunities for both local and international investors and traders. South Sudan, they need people to come here. So if you come here just for work, they are welcome with you. But if you come, you want to work to get money, uh, it's good. There is no any challenges here in South Sudan. According to the World Bank's latest South Sudan Economic Monitor, the improving microeconomic conditions and relative peace that have supported a rebound of growth in services and trade, South Sudan's economy is projected to grow by 1.2%. And that is where we pick up our conversation with John and his guests in Juba. I have lived in Juba for a week and a half, and uh, I am feeling it because people call you, people tell you their problems, and even when you go to the markets, speak to traders, they say the prices of things are no longer what they used to be. And uh, the common men and women are really struggling to put food on the table. Mr. Minister, this is within your docket. The government is, the, the people are looking to the government for a solution. And at the same time, they also think the government should really do something so that people can have food on the table. What is happening? Yeah, uh, yeah for, of course, uh, it is the duty of the government to make sure that there is food on every table, every South Sudanese table. And this is an overall policy by all the governments of the world. But here comes in the difference between the state, between the countries, as the case may be. There are some countries there that have sufficient resources and they are capable of rendering those services. And there are some countries that are grappling with other things. And as such, they cannot actually provide food on the table for the people, for its people. South Sudan is one of them. It's one of them because the problems that are heaped for South Sudan to resolve are so many. And our resources, even though the civil society is asking where our money is going, our money it's, is it's going... It's quite a legitimate question. Our, we have our, oil. Yes, we have oil. our money, money. It, even if you have the oil, it doesn't mean that that money of the oil is just open and it flows like that. Of course, the production has its own limitations. The, pro, the market prices have their own limitations. Our world commitments, international commitments, they have our own implementations. Implementation of the agreement itself has its own implementations. And above all, uh, yes, our implementation of the agreement with all the concerns where you have thousands of MPs at present. You have 650 650,000, 650 MPs Members at the national the level. National and state? Or national, about national level only. The state council of states and the national assembly, there are 650. There are 100 members in each state. 
and we have 10 states and three administrative areas. These are members of parliament alone. And then you go to the staff. So you find that, in fact, South Sudan is a, is a country where there is real overemployment, overstaffing. And as such, we are overspending. So the whole budget, whatever comes from the oil, goes to these, these situations for them to function. But even these institutions though, have even, not been paid also for a long time. Civil servants have not received their salaries for a long time. Don't say they have not received. They have, they have been receiving. When was the because last time? When was the last time? Yes. The last time was last, last week. La we are in January. We are we in still July. Are hmm? We still have an issue of arrears. Uh, okay. Yes, there are arrears. Mm -hmm. There are arrears, but we are paying. And, and, and I've just been reminded that we have 10 minutes left, so I would want to make good use of that 10 minutes. I give you an opportunity, Minister Stephen Parr, to chat the way forward. Election is coming in 2023. I have seen your one partner from the agreement is warming up, mobilizing its members. That's the SPLM in government. They are warming up, mobilizing their members, saying, come rain, come sunshine, we must have elections. Well, I, in two minutes, I, give us, yeah, give us I, your I, reading on what, how do you see the slow implementation impacting the democratic transition? It will impact it big time because the, the agreement is very clear on what to do before the elections. Um, in Chapter 2, we are talking about security arrangements. You know that the cause of most of the turmoil in Africa happen after what you call post-election violence. You need to organize. Are you predicting it in no, South Sudan? I'm just telling you this one. You cannot take a country with two armies to the election. That's one thing. The other thing is there is a provision for drafting constitution which will tell you what kind of government we are electing people to. There must also be a census done for us to draw out and map out our constituencies. Uh, the electoral law is also not uh, reviewed and amended and assented into law yet by the president. So whoever is talking about election now is not in, in, in his right mind. I don't even think that the SPLM, SPLA, I mean the, the SPLM party, meant elections. But I've seen sure. the Secretary General traveling from uh, one state I, to another, I think, I, calling I, I, on its members to I, I think we are, we are, we, they are just organizing themselves. We are also as I organizing ourselves. But about elections, you need to look critically at the provision of the agreement. Governments are established by constitutions, not, cons not government establishing constitution. It is a permanent constitution which we are going to make. That will establish that system of government to which you elect official. Thank you. Lorna, these delays, the things that we have discussed here, the economy, the lack of political will, the unified forces still at cantonment sites, how is that going to impact the democratic transition, because at the end of the transitional period, there has to be something done. How is this going to impact? Thank you very much. It's definitely going to impact the transition. How? The desire of the people is that at least South Sudan should transit from this kind of arrangement into a normal governance system by 2023. But unfortunately, the way things are right now, we are not, it's not feasible to conduct elections 60 days before end of the transitional period. And I fear for my two fellow panelists that if nothing is done, the institutions that they had are going to lose legitimacy. And we are going to have a country that have a government, yes, they can still go to their offices, but not legitimate. And I think this is a very difficult question for the country. It's important we start thinking of the way forward. Again, back to where I started from. 
we need to develop instruments for actualizing what we have planned. Right now, we are looking at constitution making process, we are looking at elections coming, but if you look at the state of electoral commission right now, you will be out of this world to think that they will conduct elections. And I want to come back to what Honorable Michael said earlier. Perhaps we need to, if we talk about help from the internationals, we need to define the kind of help. And I think election is an area where we might need to call for help from outside to be able to conduct a credible, free, fair election in Thank South Thank you. Sudan. Minister Michael Wakui, the people that we speak to are saying doing elections in an environment that is in South Sudan today is a recipe for disaster. They're saying security is a major concern. Uh, it's an open secret that uh, chiefs of organized forces went to Tonch to quell down a situation there where some senior officers uh, were, were shot. And this is just an example of other crises that are in the places. Is the government still set to move forward with this plan for elections after the transitional period? Yes, uh, in fact, uh when we say the government, I don't think that we are sitting here as government. I'm sitting here as SPLM, he is an I.O., as you can see. But when we go and sit in the cabinet, we are the government. When we perform our functions and duties, we are one. But when, I, when we are expect, expressing opinions, we are different. So I represent my party, and he represents his party. This is why he said, we are organizing, preparing for the... And in fact, his chairman declared, it is in the newspapers, that they are, we are going for elections. How about for your me, chairman? How about me, your chairman? Uh, for I, 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 I would love to correct that. Let's, for, let's come for, back to for, him. Let's for give him an I opportunity say, to finish, then you come well, back for to me, I say, he's running. For me, I say, we cannot put the cart before the horse. From now up to January, up to February, is enough time. There is still space for us to implement some of the provisions that have not yet been implemented. That is one. Number two, it is not us here who will be deciding the fate of the agreement and, the, and the, as to whether people will go for elections or not. It is the principles who are signatory to the agreement that will sit. You're talking of the five vice presidents? Yeah, not Four. the five. Five Four. vice presidents are not signatories, uh, are not the only signatories to the agreement. And they are not signatories to the agreement. But principles, the parties who are signatory, the, the, SP, the SPLM in government, the IO, the OPP, so. SOA, and, and uh, FDs. These are the signatories to the agreement. These are the people who will sit and decide based on the evaluation that will, they will get. Each and every party, is, I presume, is at present making its own evaluation and everything so that when time comes, they will be in a position to sit and decide. So I cannot talk at this time as to whether there will be elections or not. Stephen Parr, you have something burning. Yeah, I want to close with I, that so I, that uh, I, we can move forward. Just know, briefly, I, one I, minute. I agree. One with, minute. And I, we can I, agree, I, agree, that. I agree with Honorable Michael that he can speak his, for his party. But it's wrong for him to speak for my party. The position, the political position of the SPLM IO now, and that is what our chairman, Dr. Riek Machar, said last Saturday. And this need to come very clearly, we are not afraid of election as a party. We are just saying that the conditions for elections are not there. And the conditions set for elections in the agreements are very clear. They are actually the major stipulation of the agreement. Should the major stipulations of the agreement, such as census, constitutional making process, and other political arrangements happen to be in place like Honorable Makwe is now predicting. I hope his predictions are correct. If his prediction come true, 
the SPLMS PLA IO will be ready to go for election. Let's end it on that high note that you, the SPLM IO, will be ready when the conditions are conducive. Uh, thank you very much, Absolutely. Uh, distinguished guest, and my sister here for turning up for this uh, fruitful and peaceful discussion. I must say this was a nice South Sudan dialogue that uh, ended up peacefully. My colleague John Tanza there speaking to political leaders and analysts about South Sudan's road to democracy. On the other side of the break, we hit the streets of Juba and ask the people of South Sudan what they want for the future of their country. We'll be right back. like here in Yambio, we can be able to proceed to Juba and even in some parts of the southern Sudan. We need the roads to be good and security also to be good so that we can be free. We have really deviated from the originality of our identity as South Sudanese, but I would really appeal that we forget about all those ethnic lines and return back to our social cohesion. It was one of the best that all over, I think, Africa, there wasn't any social cohesion and solidarity that people would really stand for each other like like you know in it, like, like before we cannot wait for somebody to bring us the peace not the african union not the international community not the rome initiative those are just assistance but they cannot bring us peace we are the only people that can bring our own peace to south sudan three quarters of us some of their family members is in diaspora, in the neighboring countries, in the Fiji camp, they're not in their village, they're not in other places. This is concern. It's something that's gonna concern all of us. Like we, we feel like something is wrong. Because if my my family members in, is not in their right place, how, how do you want me to call that as a peace in the country? If there's no war, uh, we need the government to, to provide the uh, uh, proper ro uh, ro uh, road, uh, road network to connect the state with the states, uh, with the Tamak Road, with the Maram Roads and so on. So what we see, we see now from Juba to Bo, which is great, that is great. If it also happen, happens to Western Equatoria, from Western Equatoria it links the, uh, to, to, to Bahara Ghazal, from Bahara Ghazal again to, so th that means now the network, the road network will be everywhere and, uh, and uh, the, 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 the commodity will be every, at every corner and the poverty will not also be there. And that wraps up our special edition of Straight Talk Africa. Thank you to our hardworking team in Juba, John Tanza, Karina Chowdhury and Andrew Wani. Thank you to all of our affiliate stations for airing this show across the African continent. And of course, as always, a big thank you to you, our audience, for joining us on television, radio and online. Thank you for always watching and always listening. From our teams in Washington and South Sudan, do take care. We'll see you next time. Go well. Goodbye.